about the technology. As um, some of you will know, we've been live streaming at the Yora Seminars um, for the last few um, installments, and that's gone generally quite well. Uh, uh, we've had good feedback and, in fact, have been asked to go further and to live stream the question period uh, as well. So for those of you who ask questions, I just wanted to let you know that your voices, not your faces, but your voices will be uh, on the audio recording. Um, so hopefully you're still keen to, to participate in that. Um, and this is the first time ever that we are actually live linked to another university. Uh, as well, and the Department of Archaeology uh, at the University of Southampton has an archaeological computing research group that was keen uh, to join in on the conversation. So they're on the other end of the stream right now, and you'll see them later as we enter into the question um, period. We'll bring them up, uh, and you can see right, the crowd over there, um, and we'll be able to participate in that in the question uh, period as well. So if you use Twitter. Um, uh, please feel free to tweet uh, important uh, things using hashtag yours, Y O H R S. And um, that's the background on the technology. Um, thanks to Alice uh, Watterson, who has graciously allowed us to do all of this experimental stuff <laughs> uh, with the technology. Um, but also is doing some incredible uh, work herself. I am. Um, met Alice when I was a PhD student at Southampton and she was doing her master's degree at the time and was doing some really interesting work that we incorporated into the um, English Heritage Sponsored Visualization and Archaeology uh, project. And then Alice uh, moved on from Southampton to uh, the, um, uh, I guess, Glasgow School of Art where there is no archaeology department. She is the representative. <laughs> of archaeology there, <laughs> and has been doing some spectacular stuff uh, that she will um, describe to you in more depth. She's been a great friend to me, and is also very inspiring as a, as a scholar. So I'm very pleased uh, and feel very privileged that you came uh, to speak with us. So um, you can follow Alice on Twitter, and you can follow her blog. Um, can you tell me the name? Because it's long. <laughs> it's um, Digital Dirt Virtual Past. Um, at, I think it's Word, WordPress. Yeah, I've, I've got it up on the screen at the end, so don't worry. You can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it covered. <laughs> um, so I'll pass it on to uh, Alice, who's going to be speaking to us about di digital dwelling at, at Scara Bray. And I will be turning off um, the lights, but we have a gracious volunteer in case of emergency to switch them back, <laughs> them back on. So thanks okay. so much, Alice. Thanks for the introduction. Um, Yes, if I could be a total diva and ask for the lights to be dimmed for <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, all right, first of all, thanks everyone for um, coming along and hello to everybody on the live stream as well. Um, which is probably mostly my mom watching, but never mind. Um, so today I'm going to talk you through um, basically the making of our collaborative film which focused on the late Neolithic settlement of Scarabray in Orkney. Um, just to begin with, I'll give you a little introduction to each of the collaborators on the project. So myself, Aaron Watson, and Kieran Baxter. Um, and then give you a little introduction to my research, just really to give you a bit of context to, um, to where the Scarabray project fitted in. Um, I should say before I start that the project was actually funded by Historic Scotland, so thank you very much to them for that. Um, um, okay, so I'm Alice. Uh, as Sarah explained, um, my background is primarily in archaeology, though um, I specialised in illustration and reconstruction. Um, I basically work with a range of digital media, from laser scanning and photogrammetry to uh, 3D modelling, and I also produce a lot of animations. Um, I basically work with digital media just because I've always found that it's got quite fluid and very flexible workflows. Um, so the Scarabray project uh, is basically the penultimate case study for my PhD research, which in itself looks at the whole process of creating archaeological visualizations. So right from collection of data in the field through to creation of 3D models and animations, and then consumption of the result by varying audiences. Um, there's a number of uh, research questions and research problems that, um, that I have. Um, and these issues, uh, firstly, um, 
one of the main ones is that I feel um, the application of visualization in archaeology at present is perhaps falling quite short of its potential. Um, so, for example, I think that regardless of the medium used, um, a lot of visualizations still tend to follow the traditional artist impression methodology. Um, also, at present, there's no defined methodologies for creative work in archaeology. And I think that um, in the last couple of years, there's been a really rapid uptake of a lot of new techniques and new technologies. But um, there's not been a lot of consideration for um, their impact on the interpretive process. Um, so leading up to the Scarabray work, um, I did a pilot case study on St. Kilda, uh, where I reconstructed a 19th century black house. Um, this case study was really just to, um, to consider engagement with the site at a survey stage um, and I basically worked through the process of producing uh, quite a traditional reconstruction um, just to act as a, um, I suppose you'd say kind of a control site for um, the other sites that I would then go on to look at in my research. Um, so the concerns that were raised by this field work were firstly that um, because scanning is an automated process there's a lot less engagement with the site. Um, it's very observational and it's not particularly interpretive. So, for example, um, even with something simple like um, standing building survey, in order to record the structure onto the page, you have to look at it and go, okay, so that's a door there, that section there is a window, this section of coursing has been uh, built before this section, this section has perhaps been rebuilt. Um, it's very basic interpretation, it's very simple, but um, with scanning, there's not really any of that. Um, it's really quite divorced from interpretation, I found. Um, so you can basically, you can apply the same methodology to any site. It doesn't really matter because it's complete, um, it's just total surface coverage, really. Um, another issue that I found through, um, through this case study was that um, when laser scan data is consumed and disseminated, it really tends to, um, to just produce uh, point cloud animations. And if those point cloud animations are meshed and they're textured, they really tend to only represent the site as it is today. So I found that there is, um, at present, really um, not very much integration with reconstruction in any way. Um, so the Scarabray project formed after a series of discussions between uh, me and my two collaborators, Aaron and Kieran. Um, where we basically we established a mutual concern for the ways that digital media were shaping our engagement on site. Um, and we really wanted to experiment with layering different, uh, different approaches on top of each other. Um, I'd also realized following the St. Hilda work that perhaps working in isolation, so understanding how Alice works, perhaps wasn't really effective for my contribution to the field as a whole. And so I really wanted to try working collaboratively, just to begin to understand a little more about other people's workflows. And so just to introduce the first collaborator, um, Kieran Baxter has a background in art and design, and his first degree is in animation. Um, Kieran combines digital media techniques with kiterial photography and predominantly uses structure from motion, uh, motion photogrammetry. Um, so basically, the way Kieran works is very simple and very effective. Um, he has the kite, um, which he sends up with a little camera rig, um, and the camera is shooting constantly. So he's really he's shooting the site blind because he can't review the photos until um, until he gets back on an evening. And so basically, the way Kieran works, he sends the camera up and then leaps across the site and kind of hopes for the rest. Um, and I was actually, I have to say, I was a little bit worried about him at Scarabray because obviously there's a lot of open spaces where the houses are. And I did worry he may fall in, but he's a total pro and he didn't. So, um, and the other really impressive thing, actually, about Kieran's work is the, um, just how cost effective it is. I think he's got a range of different types, um, just for different kind of wind conditions. Um, and I don't think any one type cost him, uh, cost him over £100. The camera rig itself is really cheap, and the digital camera that he uses is just a really basic, simple digital camera with the ability to shoot photos constantly. So when you see what he can actually produce with this really simple and very cheap method, it really is quite impressive. Um, so Kieran's core interest is in visual storytelling and the ways that photographic and filmic considerations can be applied to public engagement with heritage. In his own words, Kieran says that in my visualisation work, I often use the aerial view to better describe the space which the visitor experiences and allow archaeological interpretation to be situated within the visible remains. 
Um, so this example from uh, from Kieran's Yarl software, um, he used the kite photography to produce um, a model of the site, which he then animated and superimposed uh, different stages of the settlement um, onto the existing site, which really meant that um, the visitor, when they viewed the animation, um, I think, as you can see, Yarlsof is a very complex site, so it really allowed them to um, to place the sites within the context of the, the whole chronology of the site and just understand it um, in a greater depth on the um, on the top of the present day site. <laughs> um, so I was really keen to involve Kieran in the work because um, I was quite interested in how our backgrounds um, would line up together because obviously Kieran's come from an art and design background and moves into heritage and archaeology, whereas I've come from an archaeological and heritage background, and then I've moved into using much more creative methods. So I was quite interested to see um, to see if our, words, our ways of working and our methodologies were any different. Um, this is another great example of why Kieran was so great to have up in Orkney with us, um, and another example of uh, why his work is so useful. Um, so we've got the Ring of Brother in the foreground, and then um, in the background, there's the site of Vanessa Brogger, um, there's the site of Barnhouse and the Stones of Stennis, and if you look very closely, I promise you, you can actually also see um, the Mound of Maze Hall in the distance. So you can see how this uh, low altitude aerial view can really place the site within the wider landscape and it, uh, within the wider context of um, other contemporary sites. Um, I think uh, I think at Scarra Break, Kieran found that contextualization was quite a challenge because the areas of the site that we wanted to focus on were actually hidden from public view. Um, so it's quite interesting to see how he dealt with that. Um, so the next collaborator, uh, Aaron Watson, um, like me, he's got a background in archaeology as well. Um, and he's now an artist and consultant with a focus upon landscape and heritage. Um, he's very interested in the relationships between fieldwork methods and interpretation. And in his own words, Aaron says that <coughs> methods such as photography, survey, and scanning distill the embodied experience of the field worker into very specific types of records. If treated in isolation, these limit the means by which the past can be interpreted, as the resulting records are often <coughs> static, silent, and monochromatic. For example, traditional field methods silence the past. And despite this visual bias, research has shown that prehistoric sites were venues for dynamic acoustic experiences. This shows a link between method and interpretation, ultimately rendering the past static and silent. Um, so as you can see, Erin's actually done quite a bit of work up in Orkney before, and this is him doing some sound recording inside May's house. Um, he's also done quite a lot of work in Scarabray, um, I believe testing the acoustic resonances of the dressers in House One. Um, and Aaron was a really great person to have up in Orkney because not only did he seem to know everything about every single site that we visited, but he also seemed to know everybody in Orkney. So we did refer to him as the Oracle for a lot of the field work. <laughs> so you can see why he was very useful to have around. Um, so Aaron's work explores much more creative implementations of multimedia as an integral point of archaeological investigation. And he believes that alternative methods have the potential to generate new pasts. Um, so I was really keen to involve Aaron in the project because, um, as you can see, his work uh, can be quite abstract. Um, he uses concepts of uh, cubism in a lot of his work and also quite bright, vivid colours. And um, I think, obviously, this is very, um, very different to the way that um, the kinds of things that Kieran and I would produce. Um, but also, aside from the actual visual output of um, Aaron's work, his way of working and his methodologies in themselves. He's got, um, he's got a very unique way of seeing the site and of, of working, so that was quite interesting as well, not only in terms of the output, but also his process that he goes through. So I'm sure everybody's already familiar with the site, but um, just in case, I'll give you a little bit of archaeological background. Um, the Neolithic in Orkney roughly dates to between 4,500 and 2,000 BC. And it's really significant because it marks a point in time when people are altering the environment for their own needs. So they're building monumental architecture and they're starting to domesticate animals. It really marks a transition between people who are living with nature to people who are beginning to dominate their environment. So I suppose you could say it's kind of the dawn of modernity. Um, there are a number of key reasons for us choosing the site. Hopefully this is going to work, yes. Um, firstly, it's got excellent upstanding preservation which meant it was absolutely perfect uh, for laser scanning and also for uh, kite photography. 
Um, the site has been scanned by the Scottish Ten Project a couple of years ago as well, which meant there was just there was a lot of data for us to utilise as part of the project. Um, again, I'm sure everybody's familiar with laser scanning, but I'll just very quickly uh, describe the process to you. It's very simple. Um, we basically we set up the machine at a number of points within the site, and that machine sends out a laser beam which hits the surface and reflects back, and um, that creates a point in 3D space. Um, these point clouds can then be processed um, through a process called meshing, which basically produces a solid model of the site. And these uh, solid models can then be overlaid with textures from photogrammetry. Um, I think it's important to point out with this that um, obviously it would have been possible for us to just um, produce a model of the site from scratch in the 3D software. Um, but laser scanning really proved to be invaluable on this project just because the, um, the software that I use, I work with 3D Max and a lot of AutoCAD programs. And I think those are often uh, built and engineered with architects in mind. So that means that they're very good at straight lines and they're very good at right angles, but they're not particularly good at producing organic shapes. So with a site like Scarabray, which is so complex and really the essence of the whole site, is in its architecture. It was just completely invaluable to um, to have all that data to be able to utilize, and I really don't think we would have been able to produce what we did without having that. Um, so visitors to the site today, I think they've got quite an odd perspective looking down into the houses from above. Um, it's not really the perspective that somebody who would have once lived there would have had. Um, so as a result of that, we really wanted to make the film uh, feel much more explorative. Um, the main issues to be addressed through the fieldwork were, um, firstly, that we felt the interpretive process was perhaps being mediated by technologies, and that those technologies, when they're used, are often used in isolation. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, um, we felt that although the technology was advancing, perhaps the theory and consumption really wasn't. Um, so our film. It's essentially an experiment in finding a balance between systematic and objective data collection and a much more creative dwelling perspective. Now, what I mean when I say dwelling perspective is essentially time associating with the site um, without the use of technology. So basically, you're looking with your eyes rather than through a camera lens. It's all about sensory perception, and it's all about emotional responses. So we basically we combined our time on site with laser scanning, photogrammetry, kite photography, film, painting, and drawing. And we also made a point of spending time in the wider landscape and really considering other contemporary sites nearby. And we then layered these approaches on top of each other and really tried to play to the strengths of each. So the fieldwork took place over six days in May last year. And it began with a focus group at the Orkney College in Kirkwall. And we basically got together a group of people who were familiar with the site, so perhaps through their own excavation work or work on other contemporary sites. And we posed a series of questions to them. So for example, how do you use visualization in your own work? And what interpretations of the site would you like to see developed through our project? Um, I found the answers to these questions really quite interesting, because they weren't actually in terms of artifacts and activities that they wanted to see represented on the site. They were much more in terms of the emotive side of life in the past and how people may have experienced the site. So they were interested in, for example, how the architecture may have affected movement, and they wanted to see um, the site represented in the wider context of Neolithic Orkney and the wider landscape as a whole. Um, if they had used reconstruction in their own work previously, so um, perhaps through publications or um, setting up displays in visitor centres, um, I think they said that they'd always felt restricted by having to adopt one static viewpoint. So that could be disembodied from perhaps an aerial view or embodied from um, a scene within a site. Um, so. We basically we put together a brief just to structure our time on site a little bit. Um, I think it's really important to point out here that with creative work like this, it's really easy to just create a fiction about the site. But we don't because we have to stick to the archaeological record and we're always responding to the evidence. Um, so to structure our time on site, we basically um, built, uh, well, we. Yeah, we structured our time on site around uh, Colin Richards' narrative here. Um, don't worry, you don't have to read all that. I'll summarise it for you just now. Um, it's from his 1991 paper, and it basically there's a section of it that describes the journey through the village. So um, it's moving from passage A down through passage B and towards the seven. Um, and he notes that there's significant transitional points within this journey, 
Um, so that could be inside scratch art on the walls, um, which I'll show you some examples of in a moment, um, or still stuck still slabs that um, you have to pass over, so it's kind of like moving through different transitional spaces. Um, so this map here just, used, uh, just shows the route of the film. Um, so we come in uh, with an aerial view over the village, and then down into house one, and then um, down the quite wide passage A, down into the really narrow passage B, and then into house seven here where the film concludes. Um, the whole premise of the film is basically that we're moving from the present day site to the reconstructed past. We're moving from a disembodied view above the site to a much more embodied view within the site. And we're moving from an objective interpretation to a much more subjective interpretation as the film develops. Um, the film's very much still a work in progress. Um, but today I'll just take you through some sections of the storyboard and really explain what we're trying to go for with each. Um, OK, so the aerial approach shot introduces the site from a point of view akin to the archaeological plan. And it really summarizes the site's complexity in a single overview. Um, the low altitude aerial view really places details within the site as a whole, but then we can also get a sense of the surroundings. So for example, the juxtaposition of the beach next to the site, which, um, which has played quite a large part of the story of Scarabray and certainly in its discovery. Um, so the film begins with views of the cliffs um, behind the site, just to kind of contextualize yourself within the wider landscape a little bit. I think um, Kieran wanted to let the visitor contextualize the subterranean journey the film takes from the aerial shot. And as the camera descends, we get a general overview into house one, which is the most iconic of the visible houses today on the site. Um, we then pass through eye level um, on the path where the visitor would stand today. And then um, now that we've got a bit more of a sense of orientation, uh, we move down into the house and then down into the passageway. Um, so on a technical level, this shot was achieved with kite aerial photography just to capture detail and lighting, which was then combined with 3D information derived from laser scanning. Um, so I processed some of the, um, the Scottish 10 data from the, the scanning of the site, and Kieran was then able to combine that with um, his structure from, uh, structure from motion photogrammetry. Um, this was then blended with live action footage filmed by Aaron for the final part and camera matched uh, with the CG camera. So Aaron basically stood inside house one with the camera over his head and then gradually took it down towards the door. And then we were able to, um, to camera match that with um, a CGI camera coming in. So that entire shot that you actually just saw, um, I mean, you'll see the animated version uh, at the end of the presentation, but that's actually completely CGI. Just because Kieran's that good, it looks really good. <laughs> um, so we really hoped that by interchanging different image making techniques, that the audience's journey would be governed less by the constraints of any one media and really become a much more immersive experience. Um, Kieran also spent quite a lot of time on site uh, conducting photogrammetry of the inside scratch art, which is, um, there's a lot of it inside House 7, but also in the passageways. Um, Kieran's really interested in using lighting as a narrative mechanism and how this can then be used to recreate the atmospheres and emotions associated with the site. So in the animation, we, um, we, re we try to recreate flame-lit lighting within the passageways. Um, so moving on to the next section of the film. So um, now we've uh, come through the door of House 1 and we're now into, uh, into Passage A. And we join Colin Richards' narrative, um, where, as I mentioned earlier, he notes that spatial divisions are often punctuated by decoration, marking transitional points in a journey. Um, the film really draws attention to this as um, the camera lingers across the surface of the scratch art. Um, in this shot here, you can see that um, we added in, it's a bit difficult to see now because it's a still, but it'll make much more sense again when you see the animation. Um, we added uh, kind of abstract flashes of a character which you'll encounter towards the conclusion of the film. And we did this at this point because um, we really wanted it to act as a visual cue to the audience that now that we're within the site, the narrative is becoming much more subjective. And also, we wanted to begin to build a bit of tension um, within the, the narrative for the film um, towards the conclusion. Um, OK, so reflecting a little bit about my time on site, I think I found that I was very visually focused. So I was really interested in the architecture, and I was really interested in how um, that affected kind of the choreography of my movement through the site. Um, I think this really reflects the visual media that I work in. And I think working collaboratively made, really made me quite, uh, quite reflexive on my own processes. Um, I think 
I realized that because I'm very visual, I don't always notice the more sensory elements. Um, unlike someone like uh, Aaron, who obviously has a background in acoustics, um, which means that he's really kind of clued into that. But um, it takes me a little more time to kind of uh, to get my eye, well, to get my ear in, not to get my eye in, but um, with elements like that. Um, I also felt that the field work was really moving between um, linear methods and much more creative approaches quite fluidly. Um, now, what I mean when I say linear methods, um, essentially conventional survey techniques, um, I find operate along a linear pipeline. So they're very systematic. So you collect your data in the field, you process your data, you model your data. Um, compare this to creative approaches, which don't always conform to an established workflow. Um, this meant that we were frequently considering a multitude of stages in the process all at once. I think um, research and fieldwork like ours, which integrates a much more embodied and creative approach uh, to interpretation, can be subject to multiple variables, which will result in the cognitive process being very different every time. Um, now, this means that it's obviously very hard to quantify, but um, it's a very, very interesting way of working, and it's very rewarding, um, as I hope you'll see. <coughs> Um, so moving into the next section of the film, we move down into Passage B. Now, Passage B at Scarabray, it's really tight, it's claustrophobic, <laughs> it's really uncomfortable. Um, and we wanted to emphasise this by um, making the protagonist's hands uh, visible, scrabbling along the passageway, so it makes it feel like you're, um, it's closing in. Um, also, at this point in the film, we really wanted uh, the viewer to feel like they were becoming much more embodied. So being able to see the protagonist's hand as you're moving down a passageway was our way of doing that. <laughs> um, so as we move uh, down towards House 7 and come around the corner of Passage B, um, you'll see that there's a fire outside the entrance uh, to House 7. Um, this is quite a familiar feature at a lot of sites in Orkney, particularly at Barnhouse. Um, and ethnography suggests that fire could have a cleansing symbolism. So it's the idea that you're moving into a different transitional space and you, you pass through fire and it's cleansing. Um, so. Moving into House 7 now, um, we're now in a completely CG environment. So this was built up from the laser scans of the site, the photogrammetry textures, and then um, I built in a lot of the reconstructed elements. So the character, the artifacts, um, rebuilt the roof, and um, added in a lot of atmosphere um, into that. Um, as you move into House 7, you'll see that the artifacts that we chose to represent in the foreground are very ritual specific. So there's pots of ochre um, because we think people might have been painting their skin. And we certainly know from evidence that, um, that they're painted onto stone and painted onto scratch art. Um, there is a lot of kind of medicinal herbs and berries and pots of things. Um, there's a cow skull, which was excavated from the uh, a ritual context in the um, left hand side bed. Um, and then the much more domestic artifacts are kind of placed to the background. So you've got fishing nets, you've got a drying hide, um, you've got stone axes and, and drying food in the ceiling. And we really, um, we placed the ritual artifacts in the foreground because um, that was the interpretation that we decided to go for with um, House 7. And we decided on that because House 7 at Scarabray, it's archaeologically very different to the rest of the site. Um, for one, it's peripheral to the rest of the village, so you have to go down um, its own passageway to reach it. It's away from the other houses. Um, it's possible to lock House 7 from the outside, so you can actually lock people in. Um, and also, most significantly for us, um, there were two female burials in the right-hand side bed, um, which were uh, placed there when the house was built. And House 7 is one of the earliest uh, houses at Scarabray. Um, so that was reflected in the fact that we chose to represent a female character sat behind the fire. Um, also, something that didn't make it into the final edit of the film, we did quite a lot of filming um, at Maze Howe Chamber 2, um, walking down, uh, filming down into the passageway and into the chamber. And we wanted to make a parallel between Passage B being a really tight and uncomfortable struggle um, and it being quite similar to the struggle, um, although, well, Maze Howe is a much larger site, but we felt that um, it was the most recognisable, which is why we filmed there. But a lot of um, other chamber tombs in Orkney, they've got that really similar little struggle down a long passageway. Um, and something that had actually come out of the focus group was um, that people were quite interested in having... Um, having collective memory represented. So this is basically the idea that people living within Scarabray would obviously have a knowledge of other sites out with, um, out with Scarabray itself, and um, that they could also make those parallels. And 
having that close proximity to the dead in House 7. So we, we were kind of wanting to go for the idea of Houses of the Living and Houses of the Dead and uh, make that parallel there. Unfortunately, when we edited this footage um, into the sequence, it didn't really work and it was, um, it was quite confusing um, visually and we felt that the film's going to become quite confusing as it concludes, as you'll soon see. Um, so we really didn't want to push that too far too soon. Um, so moving on to, uh, oops, a couple of slides. Okay, um, moving on to Aaron's contribution to the film. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Aaron's very interested in creative methods. Um, so, for example, photo collage and abstract painting. And at Scarabray, he was really interested in how these could be used to juxtapose traditional approaches. Um, as he puts it, to make space for different kinds of interpretations to materialize. Um, at Scarborough, research has shown that the structural, uh, structural elements such as the dressers aren't solely visual, but they also have acoustic properties as well. So ultimately this renders a photograph, a spatial survey or a laser scan really quite inadequate by itself. Um, we do have a soundtrack that's currently being produced by um, John Wass, who, um, I think I'm saying that right, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, uh, that's going to really creatively explore the acoustics and soundscapes as the protagonist moves through House 7. And I think um, once that's built in uh, to the animation, it's really going to add a whole other dimension and really make it quite an intense experience. And so in the next section of the film, uh, we encounter abstract images scratched into stone. And evidence from uh, both the Nessa Brogger and the Links of Noteland um, indicate that these could have been painted with bright colours. Um, so this section basically combines uh, Kieran's photogrammetry work, which is then uh, animated and draped over with um, some of Aaron's abstract painting. Um, next, the protagonist uh, moves towards the figure who's seated by the dresser, where their experience becomes quite extraordinary and really quite disorientating. And this sequence is partly derived from our experiences of working within the darkness and confined spaces of Scarabray. Um, but it's also quite suggestive of the altered states of consciousness that are often associated with ritual. So the figure is holding a ceremonial artifact, a carved stone ball, and ultimately this is then passed to the protagonist. Um, we painted my hands with uh, grooved wear patterns for this sequence of the film, um, so this is all uh, live action footage now. Um, so, um, so this direct connection, it concludes a journey that began with the disembodied perspective of flight and then ends with an embodied and transformative encounter with a place and with a person. This is a metaphor for our engagement with the archaeological record. If we were to visit the Neolithic, it would be an unfamiliar, visceral and I think quite a scary place. The film is not a reconstruction because this would suggest that it's possible to see through the eyes of Neolithic people. Instead, it portrays the past and the present, strange, emotive, dynamic, and transformative. Um, so as you'll have noticed, the, um, the bay and the cliffs feature at the start of the film, but they also feature at the end. And we really did this just to kind of recontextualize the audience with the present day site and kind of bring them back. Um, OK, so just reflecting a little bit about the work. Um, fundamentally, this is an open-ended project whose emphasis is on living and working with the site over time as interpretations develop. Its purpose is to challenge and be constructive by opening up new avenues of thinking within the framework for archaeological evidence. We want to emphasize that although a more creative approach may be harder to quantify in the same way as systematic data collection, this does not make it any less relevant for interpretation. Scientific approaches want answers, but creative approaches instead seek to raise new questions and they avoid established stereotypes. Each individual contribution to the film could be exhibited separately, as each approach offers a unique insight into interpretation of the site, be that scientific and objective, or creative, experiential, and subjective. What is key here is the layering of multiple methods, mediums, and interpretations, avoiding using individual methods in isolation. Our approach and our methods have encouraged us to take time to experience Scarabray both with and without the use of equipment. Research schedules and traditional methodologies rarely encourage archaeologists and surveyors to just step away from their scanners and other recording machines and just simply dwell. As a creative method, the film converges survey data and the archaeological record 
alongside subjective and embodied sensory experiences. And this results in a challenging and really quite emotive portrayal of this remarkable play. Um, so I'll just show you the full film just now. Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned, it doesn't have a soundtrack yet. That's still in progress. Um, and you'll notice that uh, the character in House 7, uh, the CG character, isn't animated, um, which is something that we really wanted to have time to do, but we just ended up, we really didn't. Um, so I'll show you the full film just now. And apologies for there not being any sound.
Sorry, I didn't realise how long six and a half minutes was. <laughs> <laughs> sorry if that was really awkward, and sorry to the people on the live stream. Um, so that's the current edit of the film. Um, we think that um, that once uh, sounds added, the um, a lot of the edits might change, and we might linger longer on certain things. Um, and uh, cut out other bits, but I think um, you can appreciate the one sounds added, um, perhaps the, um, especially the there's a lot to see, um, that'll, uh, <laughs> that um, won't seem quite so long once there's sound and, and once that's built in, I think the whole experience will really come together. Um, but as I said, it's still very much a work in progress, and Erin and Kieran were uh, great to give up their time to be involved in this as well. Um, what was I going to say? Yes. Um, so uh, although the focus of my research is obviously on process rather than outcome, um, audience feedback is still really, really important and it will actually form part of the evaluation for the project and for the writing up of my thesis. Um, so I actually have some questionnaires with me um, that in your own time <laughs> would be great if, um, since I've got a captive audience here, if you guys could, it's one page, don't worry, um, but if you guys could fill that out, that, um, that would be really great. So. Um, yeah, I really hope you enjoyed that, and thanks very much for your time. And thank you, Sarah, for inviting me down to do this. Thank you so much. <laughs> live stream over so you can see the team at Southampton that's joined us and I think Alice might distribute the questionnaires in the meantime and then I'll, we'll open up the um, uh, discussion time so is your, are your speakers on so yep oh look at how many of them there <laughs> Can we hear them? Can we hear you guys? No, 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 no. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a speaker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll just we'll try. Just try. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah. <laughs> and Alice so many of them. She was also a student. So, and I think I'll open up the question and then we can change those in the garden when we hear about the world. So, is there anyone who wants to kick off on the queries of you, Alice? In the way in which we present it, uh, so it's in the narrow and narrow two cases, visual implementation of the existing written interpretation in the case of Colin Richards' uh, narrative and, and, and also the obligatory. Interpretation of, of how seven, what seven was it? The, the, the yeah, yeah, seven, uh, yeah. Building. So, I mean, it's difficult without knowing the what uh, uh, commentary you're going to put on the film. But I mean, is that is it the intention to add that on to add that explanation to the audience, or do you anticipate that the film should be more standalone? Um, well, I think uh, it really depends what the audience is that the film's going to be shown to. Um, the soundtrack that we're going to have um, won't actually have any narration with it, it's just going to be an ambient soundtrack um, that will kind of like um, build up as the a, as a film develops. Um, the way that I'm currently kind of presenting the film and the project um, it's actually up in Glasgow uh, last week. I had the film showing uh, in the archaeology department on a TV screen and then an accompanying exhibition. And the exhibition, um, it had uh, stills like you've seen today from the kite photography and the reconstructions and um, kind of the laser scans and all the elements like that. But it also had a lot of, um, a lot of black and white photographs from uh, the field work. So the exhibition itself, it had <coughs> captions as well, so it basically the exhibition um, explains the premise of the whole film, what we're going for, built in um, that we were kind of working from uh, loosely based on a narrative and all of those elements. But it also um, it has the field work built in with that. So not only do people get to see um, the uh, the final product and why we went for that, but they get to see the whole process as well. So that's currently how um, how it's being uh, kind of distributed and, um, and things like that. So. Yeah. I suppose what's the bit my question is how, how much is it a sort of standalone digital product and how much does it rely on other media in order to, for the audience to... I think, um, I think it would very much depend on where it was shown. I think if it was shown, for example, um, we're hoping to, um, we're, well we're in talks with Historic Scotland about actually showing it on site at Scarabray. I think when it's shown on site at Scarabray it will need um, that exhibition with it because obviously You've got um, a public audience coming through, and they've already been through the visitor centre, um, which has got a little interpretive film in there, and it's also um, got a lot of the artifacts and kind of explanation for that. So they've kind of come through that, come to the site, and I think they, they need that element because um, obviously not all of them are experts, and they've got different levels of understanding. I think if the film was to be shown somewhere like the um, the Pierwall Art Centre in Stromness, I don't think it would need the exhibition with it. I think um, the film could stand alone, but that's in a much more artistic context, so I really think it depends on that. Um, but certainly I think for kind of wider public consumption and in an archaeological context, it would really need that exhibition with it. Um, otherwise it's just it's a bit mad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just especially right at the end of the film, which was fantastic all the way through, I'm just wondering if, is there consciously any borrowing or influencing it's sort of aesthetic way that the films got together um, from video games. Um, it was a very first-person <coughs> narrative to it, which I thought, I thought was fascinating. But. I think um, we didn't make a, a direct. Uh, well, uh, yeah, we we didn't really consciously kind of think, okay, this is going from a gaming perspective. But certainly, when we were on site, we're kind of uh, discussing the way that the narrative was coming together. I think a couple of times we kind of did mentioned the kind of first person shooter perspective and it is very similar to that so um, it wasn't something that we did consciously but um, it's not something I'm, I might be uh, kind of compared to because I think uh, that's a very interesting perspective to, to take. Um, I suppose, sorry, <laughs> I was just going to say um, I suppose the, the only difference is that um, this is kind of a, a controlled narrative so you can't really explore it, it's a set film so that's kind of away from the, the gaming engine. Uh, thing. Well, what I was going to Follow up is that it's, it seems very much like Dear Esther. Yes. And that's the other side, that's the other side of Scotland, but still it has, and, and Dear Esther, even though it's a game and you have some sort of illusion of agency, still it's, yeah. it's rather linear, but that's okay. And I just, 
I, again, I, I was fascinated by the sort of maybe subconscious interplay between those. Um, yeah, I, I think um, Dear S is great, and I've definitely spent a lot of time kind of exploring in that, and I, I like the way that that narrative builds up. So probably subconsciously, there was like a bit of a bit of that going on. <laughs> um, is it an art project or an art project? That's the question. Can it be both? Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely. Um, it's a difficult one, I think, because I'm the one that's kind of put the, the project together, and I still very much class myself as an archaeologist. Um, I think that, um, yeah, it's, a, it's an archaeological um, project, and I think archaeologists can take benefit from it. And um, it, it's interesting, not as a, um, this is what we think the past was like, this is our interpretation of the site, but as a talking point to discuss the site. So I think it's useful in terms of that. But then um, I think when you've got such creative elements and you kind of and um, you know we've gone for that dwelling perspective and the whole way that we were working. It is very creative, so I think it's got um, it's got merit on, on that side as well. But um, I would say at the moment, um, Aaron may disagree with me and Kieran may disagree with me, but um, for my part, certainly it's um, very much grounded in, in the archaeology. Hi, I'm Keith. Um, Hello. It was really good, and I was drawn in by the sort of episode, and it made me wonder <laughs> how much work you had to put into the lighting. Where you chose to just <laughs> <laughs> Long time. Make, make up lighting, or you had some evidence in mind when you chose to put um, well, lighting effect. It did take, um, with House 7 in particular, um, we found that, um, well, first of all, moving from Passage B, we had a lot of problems. Um, so the, the film wasn't the best quality, I had to compress it quite a lot, but um, you can see that as you move into uh, to Passage B, we were going from trying to merge the live action footage that we filmed, and obviously there's a lot of natural light coming in, so we had um, you know, the exposure kind of going crazy for that. And um, once we were into Passage B, then we really wanted to build into kind of the full reconstruction, so obviously it would be very dark, but then you couldn't see anything. Mm -hmm. So we kind of had to get a bit of ambient light going there, and um, having the fire outside really helped. But um, as I said, I mean, this, this whole project was really an experiment, and I think if we were to do it again, we would have done that very differently. And, we would have perhaps had uh, the character kind of holding a, some kind of torch as you're going along there and, and done that differently. But um, within House 7, um, I spent a lot of time uh, kind of deciding how to represent the, the roof, and um, I ended up going with um, kind of taking a little bit of, uh, kind of artistic license with this in terms of we don't know they didn't have that. Um, we had uh, a <laughs> small hole to allow... Um, to allow smoke to escape from the house, so that was letting in a, a bit of light, but within House 7 itself, it, it's quite difficult with um, projects like this, because obviously you want to stick to the archaeological record, but then you've got to make it clear for people to see, so I went with um, a three-point lighting, so you've got the lights from the fire, and then there was actually um, a cold blue light behind the character, um, just to kind of make her stand out from the background. So. It's difficult because um, yeah you well. yeah you no 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 it's um, yeah I produced a few point uh, lighting scheme for that but it, it did take a long time to get the look just right because um, you didn't want too much light coming in because um, you're trying to go for that atmosphere as well to kind of complement the narrative and then also match with the live action footage that we had so um, yeah so it's a balance really. <laughs> questions. Shall we see if the uh, folks in Southampton have any to pose to uh, Alice? Mm. Hello, can you hear us? We have one question. <laughs> Speak up! Make it a good one. Can we hear them? Hear them? Hello. Hello. Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh -huh. Perfect. In this project, I assume you made your uh, rendering from a number of sources to to do the project. Did you follow a methodology in creating this project, or not? <laughs> I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry to say that again, again, it was some pain, pain. Feedback. Feedback. <laughs> Could you type it? <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear us now when we talk closer to the microphone? No, that's good, no, that's, that's good. Fine, fine, fine. That's fine. Uh, 
in your work, you worked on a number of sources to digitize your model, right? Yes, yes. Did you follow a methodology, or you just made it up as you go? Um, um, I think, oh, I can hear myself. I'll turn that off. Okay, okay. Right, right. Um, um, yeah, when yeah, uh, it kind of varied, it depended on um, um, what kind what of kind element of I was working on the film. Certainly for, 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 for how self set and um, um, I went I, to the uh, uh, chatted to people, 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 people. Um, who had done a lot of work on what the, uh, the roofs may have looked like and how to kind of reconstruct certain elements. Um, so there was, a, there was that kind of methodology there. And I was keeping um, a reconstruction diary as well um, throughout the whole process, so making a note of the decisions that I'd made and why I'd made it, and perhaps if I'd, uh, if I'd read a paper that had influenced um, me reconstructing the roof in a certain way or um, representing artifacts in a certain way, I'd, I'd kept a note of that. Um, yeah, I think, does that answer the question? Is that okay? <laughs> so, so, wait, wait, wait. yes, yes. And, um, um, it kind of, it, it, it depended when it, when got, it got into more into subjective, 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 subjective interpretation. interpretation. Um, um, it was kind of going, going, uh, going less, going less by, a by a methodology. I sound old. <laughs> 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 I think with the um, the sites that I've worked on so far um, have been very much kind of upstanding archaeology um, so I've been very lucky actually working as part of the Scottish 10 project which has meant that I've gone um, and been able to do field work on these amazing sites at um, St Kilda but then also at um, Scarabray but obviously, as I'm sure we're all aware, those sites are quite unusual in that they're upstanding and a lot of real archaeology is quite flat. Um, so I think what I'm going to do, um, hopefully, is work in another case study um, from another site which has also been laser scanned, um, but is a laser scanned excavation, so it's more of an archaeological construct um, than an actual upstanding building and to see whether the methodologies and ways of working and engagement with the site are um, affected in a different because I think that that's really the, the big gap at the moment, and that I still have. So hopefully, kind of developing that a bit more. Um, and how yeah. do you survey data? Is it primarily doing form your PhD? Yeah, might make some pie charts and graphs. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, basically, the um, the way that my thesis structure is, and um, the idea that through the process of the community visualizations, I'm looking at collection of the data in the field, so a lot of laser scanning and survey. Um, and then the process of creating these models um, and the engagement to that. So my, um, my research is really process focused because I think that's really important, certainly when you're using visualization for research it is, but obviously um, audience feedback and uh, kind of how these images are being consumed is also a really important part so that's going to form um, kind of a, a final case study and to see what the reaction is to this and just really to see if the kind of things that we were going with this film, whether people kind of got it and, and understood and, and picked up on that without having it um, kind of played for me. So hopefully that would be nice feedback. But. Any other questions from the audience here? No. What about in Southampton? Are you guys uh, satisfied? <laughs> 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 Thanks so much. Uh, Thanks so much to Hambo and everyone there tomorrow and Dean and how we organize and I am there. And I'm sorry if I need the feedback that we'll, yeah. we'll try again try another, another time to show it to you. And uh, to talk to you and facilitating all the time. And thanks so much for all of you for uh, coming in the house. So we'll be waiting around for a little bit longer. Uh, and hope to see you next week when you have yet another in uh, your season. Thank you so much and thanks to Alice so much. Oh, okay. <laughs>